So I'm going to talk a little bit about reduced SNP panels this morning and really um, go through the fact that we have been on a wild ride this last decade, haven't we? Any of you guys use the uh, Genity L uh, test when it came out in 2003? That was a one SNP test. Guys, we're talking about whole genome sequencing this year and we were talking about a one SNP test back then. We remember fondly GeneStar, Bovigen, Genesense, Pharmaceuticals with, I think it was a 23 SNP parentage panel that uh, had a very hard time telling parents from offspring. Um, and we've kind of moved on now to where we've got this range of different products um, that are being used for different applications. And it seems like every time we have one of these meetings, we've added a zero to how many we're doing on the chip. Um, and so we've got parentage chips, gene max chips, moving up in the hundreds to the low thousands. Uh, some products coming on the market, and then, of course, going up into what's called the bovine HD or the 770. And we've already spoken about the fact that whole genome sequencing is around the corner. And so, although this might appear that I've suggested that that's the end of the evolutionary cycle, I, I might actually think perhaps we're still down here and we've still got quite a way to go. And I think that the answer of this audience to how evolved is this technology is still pretty nascent would suggest that a lot of you think it's still in the development phases also. And so one of the questions we have is this is quite expensive and we'd like to get a less expensive test that gives us the same amount of information as these very expensive tests. And if we look at the costs of some of these tests, it's somewhere in the range of $10 to $200 or so dollars. And I don't know if these numbers are exactly correct at the current time. Um, but generally speaking, the ones that have less SNPs, that is the 100 or so SNP tip tests, are less expensive than the ones that have a few thousand or 50,000 and less expensive again than the very high density ones. And if we look at the ones that are specifically available for beef cattle, we've got kind of a range of in the ballpark of 10 for a parentage, 17 for a gene max, 65 or so for the 384 SNP panel and 139 or so for the bovine um, prediction out of Pfizer. <coughs> One thing I know for sure is that I think all of this is too expensive and I would totally concur with Mark in that regard. And one thing that's absolutely for sure is it's too expensive to take three different DNA samples on an animal and send one off for genetic testing to one lab and one off to parentage testing to another lab and one off to a third lab to get some sort of a molecular breeding value. And again, I think that's teething problems that the industry's had as, as different applications have de has developed. And it might not look sensible looking back on it, but that's kind of the situation we were faced with. And I use this analogy quite intentionally because I'm going to refer back to the, the revolution that's been going on with mobile communications, but I would argue that extracting DNA multiple times on an animal and sending it off to different labs makes about as much economic sense as having all of these different applications. Um, and so if you have a particularly powerful smartphone, you probably don't also need a pager. Um, and I think that what, there's different people that need pages and there's different need people that need smartphones. And I think that there's different levels of, of information that are needed and different ways that they should be accessed as a result of that. I don't think one genotyping approach fits all segments of the industry or all applications. And so I'm going to come back to that theme um, as, as I get to the end of the talk. So I was interested in, well, what is the best approach to develop a lesser cost panel? And I thought, well, let's have a look at some of the industries that are actually utilizing uh, these technologies. And particularly to go to Matt's point of the dairy and the swine and the chicken industry, which have started to implement these technologies. And how have they gone about reducing the cost of their genotyping? Because if you think about it, the value of a chicken is a lot less than the value of a beef cow. Um, and so they must have thought about what's the best way to reduce the costs of our genotyping and get the information we need. And so the first approach that I think makes the most intuitive sense and which I think originally everybody started off with was kind of doing a, a, a training population and, and that has both phenotypes and genotypes, relatively high levels of genotypes, let's say 50K, and then maybe cherry picking through the best 96 or so markers that seem to be the most highly correlated with the trait of interest. In this case, um, 
total born in the case of pigs, for example. And what the pig industry did there, and these of course are private breeding lines because the pig industry structured a little bit differently, so this is data from genus, is they went through and they said of our, our high dense or relatively high density SNPs, we're going to pick the 196 that seem to have the biggest effects on um, total born and we're going to create a custom chip that's much smaller, only 196 SNPs. And you can see that they got reasonable correlations. So this is the number that Matt referred to earlier, the, the um, correlation between their breeding values, if you will, and their phenotype of, of total born. They got reasonably good um, uh, correlations with that. The, the fatal flaw with this approach, though, is that you have one um, product that can do one trait. And so every time you want to new, do a new trait, for example, finisher mortality or scrotal hernia, you need to develop a new different set of chips that have the highest SNPs associated with that particular trait. And so if you want to do 21 traits, for example, you're going to have 21 different chips. Well, that's no longer a low-cost genotyping approach for you because now you're running 21 different custom chips. Um, and the other thing that uh, becomes quite obvious when you start to look at that is when you do do um, selecting SNPs for particular traits, the SNPs that have the highest uh, correlation with, with one particular trait are not necessarily the ones that are going to have the highest correlation with another trait. And to, to illustrate this point, I look at some data from the dairy industry. And what they're showing here is for three particular traits in the dairy industry, in this case, protein percentage, uh, the Australian selection index, which is a, a kind of a overall ranking of the animal and the profit ranking, what you can see here in this particular little graph is they tried to do reduced SNP panels, so 5,000, 4,000, down to 100 for these different traits. And you can see that as you drop from 5,000, so these would be the 5,000 most highly correlated SNPs with this particular trait, as you drop to below 1,000, your accuracies, which is shown on the y-axis, drop off really precipitously. And so what this seems to show is that if you've got less than 1,000 or so SNPs, that is the highest, um, the most important SNPs for that trait, then you tend to have very low accuracies coming out of those, those predictions. The other thing that was shown in, in uh, dairy data is um, that as you go from trait to trait, the SNPs that are the highest ranked for one trait are not always the ones that are the highest ranked for another trait. And so what this particular graph shows is for the dairy industry, if we're looking at nine different traits in this example, um, and we're looking at number of traits going across here on the x-axis, for different numbers, subsets of SNPs, um, going from uh, 500 down here up to uh, 10,000 up here, this is the percentage of shared SNP between two traits in this example. So if we're looking at, for example, a, a 500 SNP reduced SNP panel, and we're looking at two traits, there's about 8% of the SNPs are in common when you're looking at two traits. If you move across to three traits, now you've only got about 4% of the SNPs that are the highest ranked SNPs for all three traits. And as you go across here and you get to any number above six or so, you can see that there's, there's, there's no SNPs that are overlapping that are going to be the most important for all of those different traits. And so that's not unexpected. I don't think that a, a SNP that was really involved in milk production um, might not necessarily be the one that's most important for survival, for example. And so what this tends to show is that um, you're not going to um, be able to get SNPs that are going to be able to be predictive of all traits. They're going to be, um, if you're going to select SNPs for certain traits, they're going to be somewhat specific to that trait. They may have a little bit in common, like birth weight and weaning weight, for example. You could envision there might be SNPs that would affect those two traits, but they're less likely to be associated with traits that are in very different metabolic pathways. So the other approach, and I think the approach that is now the preferred approach, certainly um, in the, the poultry industry and the dairy industry, is to use um, these reduced SNPs to do imputations back up to the high density um, SNP genotypes. And so what's shown here is in the poultry industry, they've developed a 384 SNP um, panel that is being used to impute up to the 41,000 or the 41K, which is kind of analogous to the 50K in the poultry industry. And then, of course, then what that gives you the ability to do is if you can impute up to the high-density chip, 
then any phenotype that you've trained with the, with the high density chip, you can now get a genetic prediction on because you're basically no longer doing a trait specific selection of SNPs, but rather an imputation up. And we often use the word imputation, and I think it's, it's somewhat analogous to what Mark was talking about earlier, but I just want to make sure everyone understands kind of what imputation is. And basically, it's, it's kind of filling in missing values, if you will. And so if you have a low-density um, SNP chip, so for example, you have a, I don't know, a 384 SNP chip here, if you have a group of reference haplotypes, you can kind of have a look and see, well, if I have an A, an A, and an A here, which matches that particular pattern? And you can see that this kind of pink one here does, is an A and an A and an A. And so you can infer the fact that based on this reduced SNP um, haplotype, that this must be the, the SNPs that fit in the middle here. And likewise, you can figure out where the um, haplotypes are coming based on this reference uh, group of animals that you have sequence on, and basically infer or impute what all of those missing genotypes are. That's what I mean when I use the term imputation. So you're basically working back up to the, to the high density um, uh, haplotype, uh, excuse me, genotype. So basically using reduced SNP panels to impute back up to the high density SNPs uh, is the preferred approach because then you have the, the high density SNPs that you can use for prediction on anything that you have phenotypes associated with in your original training population. And so there's a data that came out of the dairy industry where um, they basically compared, uh, was it better to go and pick the best 300 SNPs for a particular trait? In this case, the trait uh, is, um, is total net merit, which is a, a dairy industry, total goodness of the animal, if you will. Um, and they looked at a reduced SNP panel of 300 with the largest effects or 300 that were equally spaced. You can see that here. And you do do a little bit better if you're, predict if you're using um, the, the largest effect ones. And you can see here it goes from 300, then 500, all the way up to the, the best 2,000. So it always does a little bit better. But of course, this is just for one trait, in this case, lifetime net merit. If you want to do more than one trait, then it would be a different set of subsnips, subsets that would be in, required. And so the better approach is to take these equally spaced SNPs that can, then can be used for imputation. And of course, this is the accuracy if you have all of the data that they had available in this particular paper. Um, and so I think that the summary is that the imputation is a, is a more robust approach because you can use it for multiple traits. And so it's kind of the preferred way to get a least, less cost uh, approach to doing imputation up to the high density. Um, and so let's have a look at the two products that are on the market. So obviously these two products are doing multiple traits. In the case of the Pfizer 50K, there's 18 of them. In the case of the Igenity, there's 21 of them. And that seems a little contrary to what I was just presenting about the fact that if you've got um, a, a, a small number of SNPs that you would get accurate um, estimates with a 384 SNP. However, these two, um, the molecular breeding values from both of these products have been run through the data in the American Angus database. And as you're all familiar, are inc incorporated into their uh, genetic evaluations on a weekly basis based on the um, correlations that have been found in that data. And this is the slide that Matt put up earlier. And we see we have very high accuracies um, in both these products. In fact, fairly analogous accuracies between the 384 SNP product and the 50K product. Um, and they're all in the range of somewhere around about 0.6. I'll just say that. Let's just pick 0.6 as a number or explaining about 36% of the genetic variation. And that's quite a bit higher than you might expect for um, a 384 SNP um, that's been selected for individual SNPs of, associated with the traits. So and additionally, those types of high accuracies um, if you look at the literature, you would have expected that they would have had to have been trained on very large numbers of um, training populations in order to get accuracies of about 0.6. And depending upon the heritability of the trait, and this is in the case of where you're training on actual phenotypic records, um, to get an accuracy of 0.6, which is about what those tests are showing, you'd need somewhere in the vicinity of, of 2,000 to, well, a very large number of records. And that isn't the number that's been used in all traits, especially traits where uh, we have a lesser number of records or traits that were actually, f actually trained on phenotypes, things like feed intake. 
And so there's, there's a bit of a, a mystery here. And so why is it that these, um, these tests are being as accurate as what they are? And so one of the things that, that I was interested in seeing is like, well, are these accuracies actually uh, what we find in, in, a, in a validation population? And so uh, a PhD student of mine, Christina Weber, has been working on developing a large set of data where we have phenotypes from offspring of, of Angus bulls that have been evaluated with these uh, genomic products. And we were basically having a look to see, well, what sort of uh, correlations did we get in our data um, on this validation population that's, that's somewhat independent of the training population. Um, so if the training population's here, the validation population probably has some overlap um, with the training population, and that's kind of the, the phenotypic data that the Angus Association used. And then there would be our animals, which would have some overlap with the American Angus Association, because these were re registered bulls. And of course, our real interest is how well do these tests work in, in kind of the commercial beef industry. And sure enough, when we got the data back, and I won't go into detail on this, on this data, um, this basically shows for weaning weight, hot carcass weight, ribeye error, and marbling score. The pale blue is the estimate that the American Angus Association had for the Igenity test, and the pale green is the estimate that the American Angus Association came up with uh, for the Pfizer test. And the dark colours, the dark blue and dark green, um, are what the correlations we found in our independent validation population. And you can see we have quite large errors because we only had a few thousand animals in our, in our validation population. But for the most part, um, these are, are, are very analogous results. And so we are seeing the kind of high levels of accuracy in, in the, um, the population that we were using. And so I think one of the things that, that can explain that is relationships between the training population and the population that it's being used in. And this is data that was um, found by Javier in, in 2010. And basically what he found was that markers can predict family relationships between animals independently of LD between the markers and the QTL, or linkage disequilibrium between the markers and the QTL. And what this shows here is accuracy on the y-axis and the additive genetic relationship. An additive genetic relationship of one is, means you're kind of training on yourself, if you will. And not surprisingly, if you use the training population as a validation population, you get very high levels of accuracy. Um, However, as you move away from the, from the training population and you're now the offspring of the training population, so the relationship now between the training population and um, the, the, where the test is being used is actually offspring, you see there's a drop in the accuracy. Um, and so that's uh, something that needs to be taken into consideration because if you have very close additive genetic relationships between the training population and where the test is being used, and that would be very expected in a seed stock situation because quite often you'd be using um, offspring of bulls that have been in the training population, then you're going to have higher levels of accuracy than if those animals are more distantly related to uh, animals in the training population. And I think um, that uh, Megan, who's going to be speaking after the break, is going to be addressing this situation. Um, and so what are the implications of this? Well, the main implication is the accuracy will drop off over the generations as the relationships between the training population and the evaluation population becomes more distant. And as I said, that's not really going to be a big issue probably for most seed stock breeders as elite seed stock are typically providing the next generation of selection candidates and so there tends to be very close genetic linkages there between those off sires and offspring. But practically from a breed association perspective, and I think this is a really important point and Matt alluded to it earlier, um, is that we're going to need to keep retraining these populations every generation to keep that accuracy level high so that the relationship between training and where it's being used is high. And that's going to require both access to, to genotypes and phenotypes for, for selection candidates and also potentially additional costly phenotyping if we're looking at traits that aren't routinely recorded and things like feed efficiency and disease resistance. And so there's some practical um, implications of, of that uh, relationship. So that's, that's where we've been. Um, and one of the things that I think is most exciting, and I, I'm going to ask you to pick up your clickers here to, to answer this question, and it really ties in a little bit to, to Mark's talk earlier, 
is we've had this situation where we've had different tests for different applications, and we're now moving to a situation where we're starting to get a single test for a single application. And I'll pick on the, the GeneSeq genomic profiler here. I happen to pick the one for dairy here, but it's an existing product that's, that's on the market at the moment that includes about 7,000 SNPs that are called the LD SNP chip, which is used for imputation in bovines. So basically, it's taking what I said, that the better approach where you're using the low density SNP to impute up to the 50K um, genotypes to give you uh, that information for genetic prediction. It's also got SNPs for proprietary single gene tests. So for example, you could do um, testing for genetic defects or, or single gene recessive traits. It's got SNPs to help um, to detect haplotypes that are Im implicated with fertility in dairy cattle in the case of dairy. And then also SNPs to enable the impution of uh, microsatellite alleles to enable a conversion of old data that's been um, parentage tested using microsatellites to SNP data. Um, and that's just kind of a transition that I think the industry is going to have to go through in the next few years. Um, and so now we've got kind of this single product that has multiple applications. And so I guess I put to you um, in the audience, how much would you be willing to pay for a test that could be used for multiple purposes? Um, so I'm going to use the example I just gave there. So it could be used for imputation for multiple, uh, multiple traits, uh, and it could be used for parentage and recessive conditions, um, coat color, horns, or defects. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to think about this because it's actually, um, it, it probably has different value to different different people, but it's, it's really the, where we're at now, and I think we'd all like it to be uh, as cheap as possible, but uh, realistically, what, what uh, do people feel that they'd be willing to pay for a test like that? Okay, good. Five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Wow, that is a nice normal distribution, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe I should have put 10 in the middle there, but okay, that's, that's really interesting. Okay, so, but the majority of you went for the 20 to $30 range, and I, I'm not doing market research for GeneSeq here, but I'm going to come back to my, um, my analogy that I used to the mobile communications technology, and, and I'm going to talk about the fact that in, I think Ideally, we only want to genotype each animal once. I think we can all probably agree on that as being a sensible thing. And I'm going to talk about the fact that there's different types of animals in the industry. There's the incredibly expensive AI bulls. Um, then there's the seed stock and bull multiplier bulls who have a lesser value, perhaps. Registered females, who may also be up here, but and stock bulls, the, sorry, it's still from Ireland. Uh, that's commercial ranch bulls that are going into the commercial sector. And then there's commercial cattle that are in the, in the, out in the field. And that black line there says, no other sector is making cattle. That's all the cattle we make. Everybody else is using those cattle. And so to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense for these guys to be genotyping cattle. I think these guys should genotype cattle. And then we need to have these guys have access to the genotypes of the cattle up here. And so my analogy to the, to the mobile device data access plan is, you need a really expensive, probably, approach for these very valuable nucleus animals. So perhaps full genome sequence, or maybe you need iPad access for those guys. Whereas the seed stock bull multiplier, maybe you only need the 770K product um, or just an iPhone. These guys, maybe you just need a, a talk and text smartphone. Um, you don't need all of the bells and whistles that go along with full genome sequence. And you may get away with that with 50K genotyping and parentage and single tra gene traits and recessives. And then perhaps the commercial cattle sector um, can get by with the imputation, the 7K or so to do the imputation up to 50K and parentage and single recessives. And then these guys really don't even need a phone. Um, all they need is some sort of access to this data from up here. And most likely they need access to the data that the commercial guys are getting because that's going to be the animals that are coming down into the feedlot um, setting. And this next column is, is my kind of imagination or envisionation of, of what might be reasonable prices for each of these different um, data plans, if you will. And I don't know, I know uh, Mark 
said maybe you could get down to $2.50 or so, but there's, with genotype e extraction costs and having someone to put all this together, there's probably going to be a little bit of uh, cost in there. But if we can get down there and then have them just access the, the genotypes at the feedlot, that makes a lot more sense to me than genotyping at the feedlot and then having to wait for that data to come back before they can make their um, management selection decisions on it. Um, and so it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about it, but it was um, something that uh, kind of made sense to me in terms of, of how, how you would want to spread that value and not have the most expensive tests being done by um, the sectors that aren't getting as much value out of it as animals that are producing a lot of progeny. So in conclusion, um, the reduced SNP panels, I think that make the most sense are for imputation to higher density genotypes because that enables you to do prediction on multiple traits. Anything you've trained your training population on, it would give you that ability. Decreased genotyping costs, I think, will make panels of 100 or 200 SNPs kind of obsolete in the future. I think the few thousand SNPs are going to be the, the low cost genotyping platform of the future and we'll look back at, well, why would you ever want 96? You know, that, that's going to look back and think that was not a very wise idea. The same way we look back and think one SNP for um, leptin probably wasn't a very good idea. And it's likely that one test will provide information for different uses um, and thereby, I think, deliver more value to, to the whole, um, for, for the costs of genotyping and collect DNA collection. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because um, Matt thinks he's off easy. And I want to talk about something not very pleasant that's going on in California at the moment. And I don't know if you guys watched the news last November, but... Um, we had a very nasty incident on UC Davis campus uh, where we had some, some out-of-state agitators come and uh, stir up our students on, on campus and so as a result the Chancellor of UC Davis sent a um, policeman out and they pepper sprayed um, these agitators and UC D students. And uh, so, yeah, the, the Chancellor was very worried about these out-of-state agitators and so I'm going to give you one final clicker question here. Which would you think would be the person least likely to participate in the Occupy Davis movement last fall? And I'll go through these people in case they're not familiar to you. Um, this gentleman's name is Wavy Gravy. Um, he's actually a Grateful Dead uh, aficionado. He's often at Grateful Dead concerts. He lives in California. Uh, you might recognize this gentleman, Michael Pollan, uh, also based at Berkeley, but uh, out California way. Uh, this gentleman you might recognise lives in Nebraska and this is um, it's the offspring of a UC Davis professor, I, I better remain nameless, uh, who's <laughs> uh, who is a bit of an agitator himself. So I was just curious uh, if you want to, want to key in here, who do you think is the, the least likely to have participated in the Occupy Davis movement last fall? See how you guys do here. Well, Matt, you've got a good strong following there. <laughs> What's concerning is that 46% didn't think that that was the case. <laughs> and actually, what, I, what is more shocking for this audience, and I'm sorry to have to inform you guys, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So as it happened, uh, Matt, Matt came out to speak to the California cattlemen at exactly the same time that all this was going on out in Davis, and so he, he foolishly allowed me to take his photo at the <laughs> Occupy Davis. <laughs> and it's like, anyone that knows me would never allow that to happen. So I fear this may be my last visit to Nebraska. It's been, <laughs> been fun knowing you, and uh, I appreciate the offer, and thanks again for inviting me.